Turn to page 6 and section 8. Zupudi, what do you think if someone filled the three great chilio cosms with the seven precious treasures as an act of generosity, would this merit be great? The venerable Zupudi replied, very great, well honored one. Why? Because this merit is not the nature of merit. That's why the Dharagata says it is great. It is because the very nature of virtue and happiness are not virtue and happiness that the Dharagata is able to speak about. Thus why the Dharagata says the virtue and happiness is great. So, section 7, the previous section, emphasizes on non-attachment to the Dharma, non-attachment to emptiness. So, we must remember that uh, sunyata, or emptiness, in the common English language, sunyata is emptiness. Emptiness does not mean just nothing. There's nothing. So you don't have to do anything, because finally, there's nothing. Well, that's not what it means. Emptiness does not mean that there is nothing. Um, we already explained it. Emptiness, it's because of causality, impermanence, all causes come together will give an effect. If there's a cause, there's an effect. Uh, but every cause and effect does not have its own nature. It's because all these attributes put together that, that the effect comes true. So here it says the, uh, the Buddha wants us to know that if we're doing meritorious deeds, it does not mean that some people would say, oh, it's empty, so we don't have to do any charity. It's empty anyway. It's nothing. We don't do it like that. Because when you do meritorious deeds, there are really, uh, the merits accrue to it. Uh, you will enjoy the results. Uh, it does not matter whether you attach to the merits a lot or not, merits do arise. The Buddha wants to affirm this, so he asked Suputi, what do you think if someone fill the 3,000 galaxies of worlds with the seven treasures and gave all away in gifts of arms? Would this be great benefits? In other words, the Buddha is comparing uh, form to the formless. If you always give and you give treasures away, you own these treasures, and these treasures fill up the whole galaxies. How much treasures would that be? Immeasurable, almost like immeasurable treasures. If you give these treasures away, would there be a lot of merits? So in here, the three chilo, chilio uh, cosms uh, refer to the world. When, the, when, when a Buddha talks about a world, it's not just this world. Remember. The, this is not the, the only world that we live in. It's the only world. No, there's millions of galaxies, millions of worlds. The Buddha said that 2,600 years ago. Uh, what is a, a, a chilio cosms? Uh, Mang Sumuro, they use a, a measurement unit. Mang, Suru, uh, Mang Sumuro and its seven surrounding continents, eight seas and the ring of iron, Iron mountains form one small world. That's called a small world. One thousand of these small worlds form a small chiliocosms. Uh, One thousand of small uh, chiliocosms form a medium chiliocosms. So one thousand times one thousand times one thousand become a million. So it's just giving an example of how, how vast, how immeasurable, how boundless the world is. So the, 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 the sutra usually used the seven treasures of jewels to exemplify the quantity of the merits. If you can fill the whole world with this kind of treasures, um, is the merit, is it big enough? Is it good enough? If you, if you do charity, giving away all these seven treasures. What are these seven treasures? 
gold, silver, uh, lapis uh, lazuli, uh, crystal, agate, red pearls, and, and rubies. These are the seven, seven treasures. So when the Venerable Suputi replied, saying that very great, well honored one, Bhagavate, why? Because this merit is not the nature of merit. That's why the Dharakata sets is merit. It is not the nature of merit because it's just form. Form with its integrate. The merit, we should not attach to the merit. Uh, Subhuti said this merit is very great, but if these deeds are performed with the intention of acquiring merits, that means you attach to the fallacious notion of the giver, the recipient, the act, or the object of giving. You still attach to the object of giving. You still attach to the fact that you have a lot of merits from it. It's just like donation. I donate ten dollars. I donate ten thousand dollars, five thousand dollars. I have a lot of merits. I want my name to be known. I, don't, I want everybody to know that I donate so much money. You know, that's an attachment. You donate without condition, without aggrandizement of your ego. Some people like to donate with, with recognition. Some people like to do some merits with recognition. They want to, know the, they want to let the whole world know that I'm doing these great things. Um, I gave a lecture and I have many, many people. I wrote a book and this book became the bestseller. My name is on, in, on the book, so I'll be a famous um, um, teacher. Um, you are the students, I'm the teacher, I'm teaching you. And you get benefits from me. Um, I'm, give, I'm, I'm accruing all kinds of merits. That's egoistic. You're trying to better yourself. You think that by being a teacher or by writing a book or by giving a lecture or by giving donations, you are doing great things to yourself. In other words, it's helping others, but at the same time you're building up your own ego. It's not ultimate. So the Buddha says, that is an attachment. You do it without condition. Is it easy? No. Is, is it easy to get rid of your ego that way? It's extremely difficult. We know the world is impermanent. We know that death is always confronting us. But do we really, do we really realize the urgency of it? Nobody thinks that he's, no, no one would think that I'm not going to live tomorrow. I may not live tomorrow. No one would think about that. They always think that they will go on and on. Even for a terminal patient, it's, it's, except for those who are really um, very pessimistic and, and who actually gives up on everything. Otherwise, nobody would think about death. Uh, everything, everyone thinks that we know that the world is impermanent, but we always think that we're going to live. Does it mean that you don't want to think about living? No, it's just you don't know the urgency of, 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 of the problem. The Buddha told us that life and death, death is always confronting us. We have to deal with it. We have to deal with this problem. And Buddhism is to deal with the death problem. We don't, we don't want to die again. We don't want to go through the same suffering again. Do, do you think that, do you know that we have suffering in this life? People not even know about it, that, that we are suffering. They don't think that, do you think that you are suffering now? I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm okay. Every Saturday I come to the temple to, to, to join a, a session of meditation. And I'm going home and I'm, um, I'm happy, so what's the problem? They don't think about it, they never think about the problem. So, um, so that's why we have to, we have to think about all these spiritual issues. Um, why? Um, why do we exist? Where do we come from? How to deal with our suffering? How to find out the causes of suffering? How to deal with it? How to resolve it? That's what the Buddhist teaching is all about. It's urgent. It's ASAP, as soon as possible. But how many people realized it? 
Every day they're going about doing the same thing every day. It's an aggrandizement of the ego. So here, um, in the Sanskrit language, merit is its punya skanta. This body, this body of merit, makes up of two forms, depending on on the kind of attitude you maintain when you perform your meritorious deeds. If you attach to the effect of the merit, then the effect is limited. However, if you do not attach to the effect of merit, it is unlimited. It is unlimited because it's, it's, it's a, it, is, it is unlimited because it is a projection of your selfless thoughts. It is limited because it's a, it's a projection of your egoistic thought. So which one you want? Which one you which attitude do you use? It's the merits are different. So the Buddha is concerned that we would misunderstand we would misunderstand emptiness by thinking that there is no need to do charity. So he emphasized on the resulting merits are empty, uh, but they are merits even though it is empty. The merits def derived from material gift is, 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 is described as great or small or little um, because it's quantifiable for, for jewels, um, jewels, pearls, all these treasures are quantifiable. But the merit of giving spiritual, spirituality, spiritual teaching is unquantifiable. The effect is so great that it, you cannot quantify it. So next, if on the other hand someone received and kept even a four-line stanza of this sutra and expound it to others, his merit would surpass that of the giver of treasures. So in other words, if anybody who give out even a four-line stanzas, the merit would be greater than giving out the seven treasures. How much? Treasures that can fill up the whole galaxy. The Buddha said, 90, 91 kalpas ago, at the time of uh, Vipassa Buddha, Anirutta, there was a, um, a, desa, uh, there was a, um, a practitioner, a monk, Anirutta, um, and his brothers, before Anirutta's become monk, Anirutta and his brothers were farmers. Anirutta, A-N-I-R-U-D-D-H-A, Anirutta, Anirutta were, and his brother, many, many kalpas ago, many, many millions of years ago, they were um, farmers, they were very poor farmers, and later the brother became a monk. And after a few years of austere and devoted practice, uh, his brother became um, Pratyaka Buddha. You know Pratyaka Buddha? Pratyaka Buddha is more or less the same as Arahat, but is even higher, the enlightenment is even higher than an Arahat. And what is an Arahat? An Arahat is someone who is already away from reincarnation. No more reincarnation from him for him. So the brother um, became, became a Pratyaka Buddha. And one year there was a drought. Um, it's so dry that there was no half a, uh, harvesting. And, and, and Aniruta, a poor farmer, didn't have enough food to eat. And his, even his brother, Pratyaka Buddha, when he was going about going for arms round, no, he couldn't get any food. And he couldn't get any food, so he went to his brother. But his brother only had one bowl of rice left. The brother donated that bowl of rice to the Pratyaka Buddha, his brother, Anuruta. Anuruta donated that one bowl of rice to his brother, uh, who was the Pratyaka Buddha. And because of that, for, since 91 kalpas ago, Anuruta, in life after life, he still have, he always have food coming up to him. He didn't really have to, to worry about not having food. So when Anuruta was the disciple under the Buddha, which is many, many years later, millions of years later, one day it was raining outside, the, uh, the disciples of the Buddha didn't go out for arms round, and the Buddha was sitting in the, in the monastery, and they were worrying about no food coming up. And the Buddha said, don't worry about that. As long as Anuruta is here, we always have food showing up. So later, 
uh, at before noon time, they will all they will laymen bring in, in food for Anuruta and for the whole Sangha organizations, Sangha congregations. So, cause need to effect, and the effect is not just one life. It's many many lives ago he already built up that effect. Next paragraph: Why to Buddha all Buddhas and their supreme enlightenment Dharma come from this sutra? Supudi, the so-called Buddhas and Dharmas, are not real Buddhas and Dharma. How come Buddhas and Dharmas are not the real Buddhas and Dharma? If you think that the Buddha, this wooden piece of stature, Buddha, is the Buddha, that's not the real Buddha. That's just a representation of the Buddha. Turn to page seven, section nine. We'll read the first paragraph. Subhuti, what do you think? Should one, a stream enterer, who is entering the stream, Srota Apana, have this thought in his mind about obtaining the fruit of entering the Ara Saint stream? The Buddha asked a question. Asked this question to Suputi. Of course, we know who Suputi is. One of the most prominent, the ten prominent elder uh, followers of the Buddha. And Suputi excel in the understanding of emptiness, sunyata, emptiness. That's why. Um, that's why he asked the question. That's why Suputi is the. Is playing almost like the um, the supporting road in the act, the supporting road. So you have the main actor and the supporting actor. If we if we draw an analogy like that, so so the Buddha asked the question: What do you think? Should a sriropana, also called a stream enterer, uh, think that in his mind that oh, I obtained, I obtained this entering into this stream. Now this is something that you, we need explanation, otherwise you don't know what we're talking about in here. Um, in the Theravada way of enlightenment, um, if we can classify Buddhism into two categories, we classify into the Hinayana approach of Buddhism and the Mahayana approach of Buddhism. Usually the scholars would classify like that. The Hinayana, sometimes it's translated as the smaller wheel. The smaller wheel, the wheel is being the wheel, that, you know, the car's wheel. And the Mahayana is the bigger wheel. Why small and why big? Just the superficial meaning, but if we research into the deeper meaning, there's a lot more. If a car has a smaller wheel, it takes the number of people, it takes it smaller. The bigger wheel takes a large amount of people. That means the Hinayana uh, is going to turn the Dharma wheel uh, by promoting the teaching. It, it, the, the magnitude is smaller, and the other Maha is a larger, um, much larger magnitude. But that's just a superficial meaning. The Hinayana is also called the Theravada. Now, smaller does not mean that it is smaller in importance. It's just a way of classifying it. Uh, do not mistake the view that the Hinayana or the Theravada is less important. No, that's not the way. That's not the way you should translate it. So we never say the Theravada is uh, it's, uh, it's not as important. It's not as subtle. Uh, no, that's not the way. Without the smaller wheel, there's no big wheel. If you don't even have a smaller wheel, how can you have a big wheel? So, so the two classification, the Hinayana sometimes, we don't call it the Hinayana, because the Hinayana um, has, uh, has a misnomer that it is smaller, so we call it the Theravada. It's uh, uh, the, the Buddhist way of living being practiced in Burma, in Thailand, in some of the parts of the world. Uh, so, according to the Theravada, according to the Theravada, there are four levels of enlightenment with the objective of getting to enlightenment, to nirvana. The first level is the lowest level, of course, 
the Sota Pana, which is the first paragraph that we have just read. The first level, this word is a Sanskrit word or Pali word, Pali, which is more or less the same, translated in English as stream enterer, enter the stream. Enter the stream of sainthood. Enter the stream of becoming enlightened, the stream of enlightenment. So there's a stream in there, he starts to enter it now. So the first level starts to enter into the stream. So he's also called the stream enterer, enterer into the saint stream. So that's the first level. Let me first explain the second level uh, first before we get into the second paragraph. Because the second, second paragraph, third paragraph, fourth paragraph deal with these four different levels. So if you don't understand these different levels of arahathood, you won't understand this paragraph. That's the reason why some, some people say, if I read the Diamond Sutra all by myself, I don't understand, I don't understand a word of what it means. Of course. You need basic, you need basic knowledge to understand the Diamond Sutra. If after you have listened to someone talking about Diamond Sutra and you understand it, that would be a rare opportunity because it's not, it's not easy to understand. You need a lot of basic knowledge to understand. But anyway, the Srotapana, according to the Theravada, I'm talking about the first level. The second level is the Sakradagamin which is the second level. The third level is Anagamin. The fourth level is the Arahat level. So there are different levels to the practice. It's just like there's different levels to meditation. Some people are beginners, some people are more advanced, stage by stage. And how do we classify this stage? On what basis do we say this is first level, second level, third level, fourth level? On what basis? Not on the basis of examination, not on the basis whether you do obtain a certificate, on the basis of how much you have eliminated your ego, how much you have got rid of your mental afflictions, how much you have purified your own mind, and how much you have done, how much effort to apply to meditation, morality, and wisdom so that you have obtained that level. So let's talk about the first paragraph. The first paragraph asked, what do you think when a Srotapana entered the stream, would he say, oh, I have already entered the stream of the sainthood. I obtained the fruit of entering the stream of the sainthood. Would he say that? Would he think in that way? That's the question. To back up a little bit, I have to explain the different levels first in order to understand this. And when, when we all start out in enlightenment, we, we're all beginners, like we're a common sentient being, an individual in this temporal world. We're, we're like everybody, every individual. Being so conscientious in, in, in practicing the Buddhist teaching, so conscientious in doing good deeds, so conscientious in seeking happiness, eliminating mental afflictions, so conscientious in trying to find out why are we here, where are we going, why are we suffering, and why do people suffer, what's the cause and effect of all this. We're trying to find out that and become, become interested in the Buddhist teaching, and then we go through some practice and we practice meditation. So after practicing for a while, we know how to practice because we obtain the practice methods, like the, the four contemplations, for example. Do you know what the four contemplations are? Um, some people who have been here for quite a while, they know what four contemplations are, but some they may not know, and it, it's, it's uh, let me just sidetrack a little bit and throw out some information to you. Buddhism is something like this. Um, one word requires a lot of supporting knowledge to it. So whenever I come to something, some terms, I would stop for a while and explain that term first before I carry on, otherwise you don't know what I'm talking about. So, a Suropana practices what? The foundation of the practice is three columns. The, the three columns of the foundation of the Buddhist teaching. The three most important columns supporting the whole building. What are these three important columns? To support the whole building. Morality, the practice of morality, 
the practice of meditation, the practice wisdom. So morality, meditation, and wisdom. How do you practice morality? Practicing morality, you really have to know in your daily life, this is what you can do, this is what you cannot do. You can't just do whatever you want. You can't just, just I'm greedy, um, I can kill, I can lie, I can commit sexual misconduct, I can do whatever I want. This is a free world. I can do it at the expense of others as long as I'm happy. That's not the way to live. There's something that you can do, there's something that you cannot do. We all understand that. If you think in such a way that, no, as long as I'm happy, I can do what I want. Now, this is the criminal's attitude to life. That's why he committed crime. Because he doesn't care as long as he, he wants to do whatever he wants. And if, if his view is not supported by the righteous view, he always gets into problems. He get, always gets into suffering. So you really have to know what you can do and what you cannot do. You can't say, I'm free to do what I want. This is democracy. Well, you misunderstand the word democracy. Democracy does not mean that you can do what you want. You can't hurt other people claiming that it's democracy. You misuse that word. So, morality is, the Buddha said, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. What is that? That's precepts. There's morality, there's precepts, there's vinaya. So there's a set of rules that, for example, abstaining from killing, abstaining from lying, abstaining from sexual misconduct, abstaining from taking intoxicants, abstaining from, oh, so many, so many rules. We call it the body, the canon of the vinaya, the canon of precepts. The canon we call praktimoksa. You really have to study it to find out. I'm just giving you the main points. The brief, the very, very brief outline. So you must know morality, the whole code of morality, the whole body of language of morality in order to study Buddhism. You already have stepped a little bit further without the support. Our class in here, for example, you started with meditation, you don't even know what proctimoxa is. You don't even know what vinaya is. You don't even know what are the basic precepts that the Buddha follower can do and cannot do. You cannot. You don't know. Now, if you're not supporting, if not, you're not supported by that understanding, you're on shaky ground. But anyway, this is just an expedient way of learning. You're, you're getting your, your shortcut. That's why I look at Lee and, and Bruce, they've just taken the five precepts. Because so slowly, you know, uh, and also Cheryl taking the five precepts and, uh, and Daphne, because you know that there's certain something that you, must, that you must obey in order to be righteous, the right view. So there's morality. And how about meditation? Given that you already have the righteous morality to understand the righteousness of the morality, what you can do and what you cannot do, you already have eliminated bad karma in you. You already know that you cannot do anything that relates to bad karma. Because why do we suffer? Because we did vicious deeds. Which is deeds brought forward mental afflictions, brought forward karma, bad karma. That's why we got suffering. You're responsible for your own actions, your, your, your speech, your thought. So that's morality. And what is meditation? Meditation is once you know morality, then you look within. You calm down your mind. You think properly. You go to the thinking part of it so that your mind, when you are in meditation, your mind is in tranquility. When your mind is in peacefulness, in tranquility, what happened? Your wisdom unfolds itself, reveals itself. And as, as long as you practice more about meditation, your wisdom level elevates to a higher and higher and higher level.
You're making advancement every day. You're making advancement in every sitting of the meditation. You're making advancement in your in, in your in your way of living. You're making advancement in your in your in your relationship with others, in your relationship with your job, with your family, with the society. Now all that improved because you're mindful of your own action, your speech, your thought. You're not just do what you want or having desultory thoughts all the time without the righteous morality. In other words, you're getting to the sainthood. You're getting to the stream of the saints, the sages, the enlightened people, Buddha, Bodhisattvas, Arahats. So you enter into that stream. So the Sriyopana is like us when he started out, beginning, learning morality, meditation, and wisdom and he was he he he, his, his, he has successfully eliminate eliminated many of the mental the afflictions that dominate his ego that brought brought forward his egoistic feelings now you really need to know what kind of mental afflictions this beginner has eliminated in order to enter the stream, whom we call him the Sroda Apana. What are these mental afflictions? All of us have these mental afflictions. We all have mental afflictions in our mind. What are these mental afflictions? Two kinds. One kind is conceptually arising afflictions. These are the afflictions in you that arises in your present life, basically, since birth. What are these? self-view, you concentrate in yourself, your ego, your view. This is my view. This is what I think. This is what I'm going to do. It may be wrong, but you just maintain your own view. I hate that guy, and nobody can change me. I'm not going to change. I hate my dad because my dad has done this. I hate my mom. I hate my brothers and sisters. I hate my... You know, you have maintained your own view, and you don't want to change it, no matter what. I discriminate this, I like this, I uphold this. I, you always have that. Nothing is going to change you. No person on earth is going to change you. That's self-view. Do you have that? Sometimes I have that. I'm practicing to, to dissolve it. That's responsible for my obstinacy. That's responsible for my arrogance, by my, for my foolishness. Self-view. The second is extreme view. Sometimes we go to extreme. Everybody has extremities in views. Some people have extreme views much stronger than the others. I have a political conviction to follow. This is it. This is communism, and I'm going to follow this. This is capitalism, I'm going to follow this. This is the Nazi thinking, I'm going to follow this. And you know, the Nazi's thinking was responsible for the killing of millions of people. But in their mind, that view is right. In their mind, that view will bring forward fortune. And of course, we all know that that view is mistaken. Now, that is extreme view. Third view is attachment to view. You maintain that view, and you don't want to change it. Fourth is view and rigid attachment to precepts. Now, some people say, this is what I believe in my precept. In the ancient days, there were a few followers of precepts, and they didn't follow precepts of the Buddha. They have their own precepts. They also have supernatural power. Mind you, Buddhism is not concentrating on building supernatural power, but when your wisdom un unfolds itself, that power inherent in you would come up. So even if you practice other things, other, other uh, way to practice, sometimes you get a little bit of preconception or uh, some, some power that is, uh, 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 that is beyond natural uh, tendencies of the senses. And these group, groups of people, uh, they saw the cow die, and they, they knew that the, the cow uh, the, the cow was reborn in heaven. And they started to think, 
why did the cow can, reborn, can, be, can be born in heaven, they eat grass only, and uh, that's the way of living, and they stick to the view that maybe we should be eating grass too. By eating grass, you're vegetarian, then you eat grass, then you'll be reborn in heaven. You, 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 you attach that rigidness in precept. That's one of the examples, for example. Rigid attachment to precept. Evil view. Greediness. Do we have greediness? You have desires? You greedy only for yourself? Greediness. We all have greediness. If, if you don't have greediness, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be in the human's realm. So we all have greediness. And then hatred, seventh is hatred. To a certain degree, we all have hatred. We all have anger. Hatred contains anger. Are you angry? Do you ang Would you be angry sometimes? There's so many forms of anger. Sometimes you don't, you don't, you don't like your you don't like your own destiny. You feel that somebody else has a better destiny than you do, and you feel angry about it. How come I have that kind of destiny? They have that kind of good destiny, and I have this. You feel angry about it. How come I'm sick? How come my relatives are sick? How come I don't have a job? How come I'm mistreated? How come I, um, how come I have an abusive childhood, while other, chi other children have, have a very fortunate childhood? You start to, instead of trying to resolve it, trying to find out reasons spiritually, you're getting angry in rejecting it. You, you think that your destiny, is being, your destiny is being dominated by some natural, supernatural beings. So that is hatred. The eighth is ignorance. Ignorance is the basis of all bad deeds. Because you don't know. You don't know the right deeds. Ignorance. Don't we have ignorance? The magnitude is different, but we all have ignorance. Nine, arrogance. We have arrogance in us, and that is inherent to arrogance, pride, self esteem. Because of this pride, arrogance, and self esteem, you defend yourself. Sometimes such a degree that you may be hurting others when you're defending yourself. Um, you don't want to endure all this because you think that I want to protect myself. I want to express this. So an arrogance. Arrogance does not mean that you always have to backtrack yourself. You always have to back up. Arrogance means internally you feel that, you, you feel that you're different. Of course you're different, but in this way you feel that you're arrogantly different. Tenth is doubt. You're always doubtful. You're doubtful of this, you're doubtful of that. So, self-view, extreme view, attachment to view, view of rigid attachment to precepts, evil view, greediness, hatred, ignorance, arrogance, and doubts. Now, these are the main points. There are details in every one of this. Self-view is also broken down to what kind of self-views. So there's a body, a school of thought in Buddhism that is called Vujnana Matrata, the study of consciousness, a special school of thought in Buddhism, uh, the Mahayana, study of the consciousness only. Now that, that school of thought goes into details of these mental afflictions. You can pursue further in this body of language. There's thousands of millions of thousands of volumes and millions of characters, millions of words written on this. This is the conceptually arising afflictions. That means most of this have been nurtured in the present life since birth, in this present life. The second kind is fundamentally innate afflictions. What do we mean by that? fundamentally innate, you're born with these things because you have your previous lives. It's not just this life that you maintain. The time dimensions the Buddha expressed to us is not just the short dimension of the past, present, and future, 
When we talk about the past, we talk about yesterday, last year, last week, last few years, or, or since birth. That's the past. But the Buddha said there's more than just this life. There's millions of years before, many millions of lives. The time dimension is outstretched to many, many years before. Isn't that logical? Think about this. If you have a past that is only limited to this life, what happened before? You're not going to cut the water flow by saying this is the section of the water. When the waterfall is falling, you say, I'm going to cut one section and I call this waterfall. Every one of this has a continuation. If you're talking about a past, it's not just last year, your past lives. How about a present? The present is easy. We can, we, now is the present. How about a future? The future is not just tomorrow, next year, two years later, five years later. Tomorrow is the time when, after this life, if you don't practice, if you have committed a lot of bad karma, you're going to carry that karma into the next life. If you, com if you committed good karma, you're going to carry the good karma into your next life. What is karma? If we, if we can simplify it, why don't we call it in a very common way, which may not be the right translation, but is easier to understand. Your energy. You think this energy is gone once you die? When I die, all my energy is gone. Energy is not, it's always continuating. It's not disintegrative. Energy always carry in one form or another. It may not be in the same form, but the energy would carry on. You can't call an end to something that you already have built up. Energy is not perceptible to senses. You can see energy. You may feel it if it's in your body. You can see, you can hear energy. Certainly you cannot smell energy, but energy would go on. The scientists would tell you that. Even the scientists have not explored into the mystics and the depth of energy. We call this the energy, but the Buddha said that's karma that brings your energy of this life into the next. What kind of energy? What have you done in your present life? You're responsible for building up that energy. Do you have good energy? Bad energy? You did it yourself. If you're always compassionate and helpful and, and you are the, the most benevolent person on, on earth, you carry that benevolent energy into the next life. There are many, many people who are philanthropists, who are helpful. They carry that good deeds into the next life. And sometimes the energy even radiates to others. Right now, I'm radiating my energy to you, and you're radiating your energy to me. In what way? If I'm talking about it, and you say, oh, this may be right, you're receptive about this, and you're bouncing back to me. Every, every energy affects all the others. If all of us are doing something in common, with one common view, one common way, one righteous way, the right way, this is very powerful. That's why Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. I want that dream to come true. A dream for the benefit of all human beings. If everybody worked towards that, the energy is so enormous. Energy will not die, you know. It rose. So, what are we talking about here? Fundamentally innate afflictions. That is inborn in you, innate in you. The previous conceptually arising afflictions have been nurtured in this life, but this one has been brought forward when you were born. And what are these? Greediness, hatred, ignorance, and arrogance. They're very strong. Now, conceptually arising afflictions also include this four, four, 
But this inertia in this life and all these other four greediness, hatred, ignorance, and arrogance, they've been brought forward many, many lives. And we suffer because of that. And sometimes we're fortunate, our destiny is so good because we brought forth better karma, which have lesser greediness, hatred, ignorance, and arrogance. Every sentient being has different magnitude in you, in us, on all these mental afflictions. All right, given that body of language in a simplified form, we can get back to the chapter, Sotapanna. The Buddha said, when the Sotapanna achieve being a Sotapanna and enter into the stream of sainthood, that means he, the Sotapanna, has already eliminated all of the conceptual arising afflictions. He has been successful in practicing morality, meditation, revealing wisdom. He has been successfully in eliminating his egoistic feelings, which are these self-views up to doubt, the ten afflictions. He has been successfully in eliminating all these that have arisen in his present life. And of course, he hasn't been successful yet in eliminating the fundamentally inborn ones. They are very subtle. They are very fine. They are very deep-rooted. They can't be removed so easily. Because for millions of years in life, you have been building the energy up. It's not easy to eliminate them. But the Soda Upana has been able to eliminate the ten conceptually arising afflictions. You understand? That's the first lower level, the Sota Apana. Do we have any Sota Apana in this room? I don't know. If you have been successful in entering the stream, what's the effect? The effect is, of course, in your present life, you enjoy peacefulness and tranquility and happiness because you're more pure in your body and mind. He's very extremely happy. The Strota Apana is extremely happy because it's a purified mind. What's the objective of living? For, for the ordinary beings, it's looking for happiness, right? Now, somebody, somebody, somebody asked, what's the purpose of living? The simple answer is, everybody is looking for happiness. Is there anyone here who does not want happiness? Is anyone here who only wants suffering? Everybody wants to be happy. How can you be happy? You mean, I have a lot of money, I'll be happy? I'll be happy if I have billions of dollars, if I have a nice home, if I have all these, I have all these possessions, of all this reputation and fame, I have a, a handsome husband, a beautiful wife, I have good children, and I have, uh, I, I'm the, 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 the CEO of one of the biggest organizations on earth. You feel happy when you have all that? Is that, the, is that the criteria for measuring happiness? No, it isn't. We know that many, many billionaires, they express that they don't feel happy. On the other, uh, the, uh, um, uh, sometimes they feel even overburdened with responsibility. They feel tension with a lot of money. So happiness is in the mind, not in material. So the Surapana is extremely happy in this present life if he becomes a Surapana. But more than just this life, you know, what happened after he dies? After he dies, he won't roll into or reincarnate into the three vicious rams anymore. What are the three vicious rams? He would not reincarnate into um, animals' kingdom. He would not reincarnate into the ghosts' kingdom. He would not reincarnate into hell as hell's victims. He would not go into vicious rams anymore. That's like a guarantee because he was able to eliminate the ego, all this egoistic feeling. In, in the process of doing it, he's been purifying himself. In other words, his energy is pure, purer than sentient beings. He doesn't have to subject himself to the suffering 
of the three vicious rams anymore. That's one thing. How about the second thing? Second effect. He has to come back approximately seven times, reincarnate into the human's ram, and continue to practice until he became the saint, the arahat. When he becomes the arahat, he's out from life and death. All right, that's a surapana, strota apana. Everybody understand this first level? The effect, the effect is, he started to practice. And he's got the method of four contemplations, morality, wisdom, and meditation, has been practicing and successfully eliminated the ten conceptually arising afflictions. That's the effect and the method, and, and that, that's the causes and the method. And effect is, he be, becomes short upon her. No more vicious rams. Seven come back. Practice again, no retrogression, not regressing, retrogression into the victims, ghost or animals realm, and after the seven approximately seven lives time, then he becomes the arahat. So if in our lifetime we can be sought upon, her, congratulation, no more suffering. There's so many sought upon us coming back. Some heroines of the of the of the world history, heroes of the world history, they come back to reform. They come back for the benefit of humans. We have a lot of examples like that. Maybe they are sought upon in a different form. Many many examples. For example, in the religious aspect, Mother Teresa, for example. For example, Jesus, for example. For example, um, Abraham Lincoln, emancipation, medically, um, many many doctors who serve humans, many politicians who sacrifice their lives for the benefit of mankind, of their folks. Many of many of these, they are sort of partners in different forms. They may not be talking about that word Buddha. Word does not count. It does not matter how you call it, but we must call it something. We、we'll、call it the Buddhist teaching. You can call it anything you want. Don't stick to the name. Name is just a method of expression. Okay, that's the sort of partner. All right, then let us get to the next paragraph. No world honor one. Why? Because sort of partner. Stream enterer means entering the stream, but actually there's no entry, no entry into either form, sound, smell, taste, touch, or dharma. That is why he is called sota apana. You know what it means? The question asks is, when the sota apana enters the stream, would he think I already obtained sota apana? I already have become the first level of sainthood. No, actually, there's in his mind there's no entry. Why? He entered into the stream, and actually there's no entry. Why? Because when he entered the stream, he already have eliminated a major portion of his ego. When he have eliminated a major portion of of his ego, that is no more no more subject and object. If he think that I am the sort of partner, I have attained this, I have obtained this. That means he has that that ego, because that is that is the the subject and the object. The subject is I. The object is I obtain this sainthood. If that is still the subject I and I obtain this, so that is a duality. That means there's still egoistic feeling. Being caused sort of pain is he already have eliminated this ego. How can there be any subject and object? How can that be something? Say, I have obtained this. Now I am this. He wouldn't say that. He would say, There's no entry, because I won't attach to the entry anymore. I won't attach to subject. I won't attach to object. Empty. If I attached, that means I have an ego. I have eliminated my ego, and the effect of this elimination of ego, the major portion of it, means that I won't attach. 
If I won't attach, how can I be attached to subject and object? No attachment. Remember the, 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 the fourfold fallacious notion of conception? Ego, personality, beings and life. Always have to remember this fallacious notion, which is wrong. Ego, ego being I, personality means you, them, they. Beings, that means all surrounding us. Life, permanence. You don't attach to permanence. Nothing is permanent. Everything is changing and fleeting. So, the Strota Apana would not say, I have entered. No, there's no entry. Not only just that, there's no attachment to, not just no entry, there's no attachment to form, to sound, to smell, to taste, to touch, or to any Dharma. Because he has been an Astrota Apana. How can he be still attached to form? He's not egoistic anymore. He won't attach to money which is form, he won't attach to a, a huge mansion, he won't attach to a, a beautiful wife, a, a, a handsome husband, he won't attach to a luxurious car, you know. No form, no attachment to form, no att attachment to sound. What is no attachment to sound? Some people yell at him and curse at him, he won't attach to that kind of sound, it does not matter. You can spit on me, you can yell at me, you can curse at me, it doesn't affect me. Because in me, there's purity and tranquility and peacefulness. I'm not attaching to any sound, no sound. Your criticism, if it's right, I accept it. If it is wrong, I endure it. Why do I have to answer back? Why do I have to fight? Why do I have to argue? The argument would further um, exaggerate the whole thing, would further uh, make the whole thing worse. So I, don't, I, don't I have no attachment to sound, no attachment, for example, to smell, to taste, and to the, and any dharma. So to me, ma po tao fu does not matter. <laughs> ma po tao fu does not matter. I'm not attached to any sound, any taste. But Mao Tao Tao Fu is good though. Tao Fu is good. It's good, but I'm not attaching to it. If I have it, fine. If I don't have it, I'm, going to, I'm not going to order it all the time. <laughs> so that's the second paragraph. The third paragraph, Subhuti, what do you think? Can a Sakradagamin, once returner, have this thought of obtaining the fruit of Sakradagamin? It's the same question. This is the second level now. In the second level, the second level is Sakradagamin, which is higher level. The practitioner, after being Sudapana, Sudapana, entered the stream, he continued to practice morality, meditation, and wisdom. He continued and continued. He is successful in eliminating some of the innate mental afflictions. He's higher level now. In the meditation, he continued to practice. How did he practice? He practiced the four contemplations. Meditation. Of course, meditation must be supported by morality. If you're always meditating, you're a meditator, and if you don't have morality, you'll never be successful. Because, because you gear your meditation to the wrong deeds. So that's why we need to take the precepts. We need to observe the precepts. You can never be enlightened without taking the precepts. In other words, if you just want to do whatever you want, even hurting others, you can do it. And on the other hand, you are a Buddhist. How can you call yourself a Buddhist? How can you practice meditation if you're doing the wrong deeds? You're contradicting yourself. So, being a Sakradagamin, you eliminated some of the innate ones. The Sota Apana only have eliminated the conceptually arising afflictions. But in this second level, he is successful in eliminating more, the innate ones. 
the greediness, the hatred, the ignorance, and the arrogance. The fourth paragraph now. Zubti replied, "No, well on the one. Why? Because Sakradagama means one's returner, one more to go and return once more. But actually, that is neither coming nor going. That is why he is called a Sakradagama. So, if you are a Sakradagama, the second level, you have done all that, your practice, and you become such a saint. What's the effect?" The effect is in this present lifetime you achieve happiness of purity in mind. And after he dies, everybody has to die anyway. After he dies, he will not get into three vicious realms anymore. He has to come back to this world of desire, this k a m a d a t t u to practice again next life. One more, one more life, not seven more. One more life, he will be successfully becoming the. Arahat, he will be away from Zamzara. He will he will be in away from reincarnation. No more reincarnation in enlightenment in Nirvana. So that's why he's called a once returner. He returns only once to this world to serve his karma, and then he will be the the Arahat. So it's once returner, returning one, coming and going. But in his mind. He wouldn't be attaching to the coming and going. He wouldn't say, "Oh, I only come one time and go one time, and that's it for me," because he already have no ego. There's no coming and going. The coming here and going. There's no more that. Coming and going is only for affairs of the temporal world. You're coming, you're going, you're sitting, you're, you're living, but in the saint's mind. Sunyata, emptiness, no coming and no going. If he attached to coming and going, he s still attached to form, sound, smell, taste, touch, and all that. He's free from attachment. How can he be attached to coming and going? So this is just to give you an example. There's no more coming and going because he's free from the ego. You're going from one place. Going is going from one place to another. Returning is returning from one place to another. You think that that is a place to go? It's not a place. It's 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 the level of the mentality. It's not a place to go. It doesn't mean that there's a place called the place of the sacred garment to go to. There's no. If it's a place, it's a form. A place must have a form. This is a place. This is a form. But to To the saint, there isn't a place. There's no attachment to form. He's not attaching himself to this form. Okay. Next, Suputi, what do you think? Can an anagamin have the thought in his mind about whether or not he can obtain the fruit of anagamin? Now, this is the third level of enlightenment. The third level of enlightenment, he has been successful in eliminating more of the innate afflictions, much more than the s a k r a d a g a m i n And his higher level, his higher level, his car no returner. That means, in this life, of course, he achieved happiness. In the next life. He does not have to return to this world of form and desire anymore. No more return. So he's called the non-returner. Going to the next paragraph, s u b u t i replied, "No, well, are no one. Why? Because anagamin means no returner, no coming or non-returning. But actually, there's no such thing as no coming, no returner, non-returning. That is why he's called anagamin, no returner. That means." Although he does not come back anymore to this world of form and desire, because he's much at a higher level, only people with karma, bad karma, would come back in here, like you and me. He does not have to come back anymore to this world. He would be residing in the world of r u p a d a t t u the world with form. No more desire, no more greediness. He will be in there, 
practicing and meditating until it becomes the arahant. So in his mind, he wouldn't say, I am now the non-returner. It wouldn't be like that because there's no egoistic feeling. If you think, I am the non-returner, I won't return to this world anymore. I am at this higher level. I have achieved this. And I'm better than all these two other levels. There's only one level I'm going to go. So in meditation, don't ask about, where am I going? What's the next level? How would I feel? You have a level to go? You know where you are. So that is non-returner. He does not have to return to this world anymore. Next, Subhuti, what do you think? Can an arahat have this thought in mind? Will I obtain the fruit of arahatship, the enlightenment of an arahat? Next paragraph, Subhuti replied, No, well honored one. Why? Because there's no dharma which is called arahatship. The arahat, of course, the final stage, after he passed away, he does not have to return anywhere, which is detached from reincarnation. No more zamzara, no more life and death. That's the highest level. All the ego is the feeling, all the ego has completely, almost completely been eliminated. No more ego. All this ego cell, that's, everybody has an ego cell, all these walls of the ego cell crumble down. We've been surrounded by these walls around us, and we call it the ego. And, this, and we feel that this ego is our comfort zone. We live in this ego and we feel extremely comfortable because this is our ego. We are com this, is the, this is our mistakenly regarded this as the, a comfort zone. But this comfort zone is the dharma, bad dharma, re, a bad karma producing zone. So when you are at the stage, all these walls crumble down. And what do you see? You see the whole wide world, unobstructed, the whole horizon. You're going to get out from this cell of the ego prison. Where are you going? All, all embraces, everywhere. Omnipresence, omnipotence, everywhere. That's why we call free. We're liberated. We're free from cell, from the jail. We liberate it. Emancipation. Full emancipation. Okay, then maybe this is the time to stop it here. I'm making improvement. I finished this. I finished this chapter, except for the last paragraph, but I will continue with the last paragraph. And uh, remember these four different levels. We can achieve, hopefully, we achieve at least the lowest level. Asura Apana, then, then we'll, we'll never get into the three vicious realms anymore. And we just, re, we like to return seven times, only giving compassion out, only helping and saving and rendering help. And some saints, even though they are higher level than the Asura Apana, they vow not to enter into Nirvana. They vow to come back all the time, eternally, to help out. What's one of the examples of this Buddhisattva? Can you give me the name? Siddhagapa. Siddhagapa Buddhisattva. He obtained a higher level, Arahat, already. But he said, I'm not going to get into Nirvana. I'm going to come back all the time, incessantly, until all human all sentient beings, every single sentient being is saved. Until there's no more hell, no more victims, then I think about Nirvana. But all these different levels, they don't have to come back. And how many are there, are there sort of upon, how many, are, how many are, are these, how many saints? Millions of these people are, already have high of that level already. And there's also a lot who vow to come back too. Siddhagabha, Avalokitesvara, they all come back. They don't, they, they don't want to leave their folks behind. And when I, sometimes when I think of that, when, uh, when uh, a very compassionate person passes away, he or she 
always vows to come back. For example, politicians or, or some hero and some uh, scholars, some musicians, some doctors, um, you name it, in different fields. They all come back to help. That's why we have good friends. That's why we have Buddhist art to us who are helping out. That's why we need to know, we need to get in contact with this Buddhist art to us. Anyone who gives you an, an advice, an advice of sincerity, an advice of benevolence, he is your Buddhist art to us. He comes back to give you that knowledge. If someone said, oh, go to the temple for meditation, it's good for you. He is your Buddhist art to us. He points you the way. Don't spend all your time on the phone, partying, karaoke, meals, movies. Go into a meditation that helps you, and you start to go meditation. He is your good friend. He is your Bodhisattva. Were honor one, if an arahat thinks I will obtain the enlightenment of an arahat, he is holding onto the false notion of an ego, a personality, a being, and a life. Well, honor one, you said that I have obtained the passionless samadhi. I surpass all men as the highest passionless arahat. Well, honor one, I do not think I am a passionless arahat. Well, honor one, if I had thought I had attained arahatship, the well honor one would not have said that Subhuti takes delight in the calm and quiet, free from temptation and distress. I am called Subhuti because I love to dwell in peaceful concentration. So in other words, if an arahat thinks that I have already attained arahat, I am already out from reincarnation, an arahat would not think that way because he doesn't have an ego. He would not think that way. If you're always thinking about, if you're always thinking about yourself, then you know that you are far away from the level of an arahat, of course. So the, the Diamond Sutra is to teach us to be free from, the ego, from your own egoistic feeling. Um, so, Subhuti is not thinking of, I'm an arahat, I'm, I'm a passionless arahat. And Subhuti would not think that, right now I have peace and calm. He would not think that way, the peace and calm just come, he would not attach to the peace and calmness. So there's absolutely no attachment. It's just like the, 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 the Heart Sutra, there's nothing to be obtained. That's emptiness.